the uh, controls to Karen. Hopefully you are seeing her screen now. And uh, Karen, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us what you've uh, got for us today. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. And I hope um, people didn't notice too much that I changed the title of my presentation uh, talking about marine education. And I intentionally um, tried to integrate Western science into indigenous multicultural environmental education instead of uh, integrating um, TEK into Western science, which is usually the norm. Um, I'm really, I wanted to thank you, Jim, and the rest of the POET crew for um, having me. I feel really honored to be um, giving this presentation to such a, an amazing audience. And so uh, anyway, I'll get on with my presentation. Um, as the school outreach coordinator at Seattle Aquarium, I've had a lot of challenges in finding the right approach to reach all of our students and, and really help them to connect to nature and the marine environment. A lot of kids now are so disconnected with the outdoors. And so um, because I work with a lot of tribal groups uh, in Western Washington, you know, I, I wanted to find a way that I could reach these students who already had a lot of inherent knowledge about the environment but didn't spend a lot of time out there. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, uh, it's been said by many researchers that um, knowledge is structured in positions in ways that produce kind of an inherent bias in their viewpoints. And this can make a big difference to their outcomes or their product. And so I know that who I am has really been greatly influenced by um, you know, my background, and you will find this in my presentation today. You know, I've always strived to incorporate multiculturalism in my work uh, using both a social and environmental justice lens as kind of a, a guiding principle in marine education, teaching, and learning. And you know, that isn't really that prevalent, uh, at least um, with people that I've been working with in the past. So you know, I've been trying to be a crusader in, in that realm. Um, I really became interested in traditional ecological knowledge, and that sort of stems from my work at Seattle Aquarium with students from Washington tribes. And I don't claim to be an expert in this field, so I feel a little bit embarrassed today because you know, what I really want to do is share with you some of the experiences, some of the mistakes that I've made, um, and what I've learned from working with tribal communities and, and really, really um, realizing and understanding the importance of integrating cultural values and understandings, uh, particularly when working with tribal youth. Okay, and so, oh no, let's see, for some reason my PowerPoint is not working. What do you think, Jim? Okay, here we go. All right. Um, Good, it's working. I think it's working now. <laughs> from, from working closely with a lot of the Coast Salish um, people, I noticed that elders always introduce themselves in relation to their ancestors, which is also sort of a Japanese tradition. So I'm going to introduce myself by way of my ancestors and my immediate family. On the left you see their, um, my grandparents, Kate um, Kimura and Wakachi Matsumoto from Hiroshima, Japan, and then um, these are my parents, Kimiko Mochizuki and Roy Matsumoto, and, and they've been a really great influence in my life. Um, I'm a child of immigrant parents and have always had a perspective of living and walking in two worlds, and this is very common with immigrant children and people of color. Um, my, my family passed on their sort of traditional ways of knowing based on kind of their Shinto and Buddhist beliefs. And they have a real connection and reverence to nature. And so, you know, I'm trying, and I guess that's always been my orientation. Um, I grew up in the 19, late 1950s and 60s um, at the height of the Civil Rights Movement. And um, I grew up in Northern Virginia, which was segregated at the time. And so I really have a lot of experience of, you know, really blatant, overt racism. Um, and then, Right after that, we, I, we moved to Berkeley, California, and that was in 1964. And so my formative years are really spent in the environment of sort of the Berkeley free speech movement, farm workers' rights, and kind of ethnic solidarity, and that really shapes my worldview. And so you might find evidence of that um, in my presentation. Um, 
I started out with this presentation being really inspired to put this together based on Coast Salish traditional ecological knowledge. But because I'm not a member of any of these tribes, I sort of felt like I was um, somehow appropriating someone else's intellectual property, and I just that didn't sit right with me. So I wanted to use examples from my own culture um, as an example of traditional knowledge. And so what I'm doing um, in this presentation is drawing from a 2,000-year-old Japanese tradition of ama and or women free divers uh, who traditionally harvested food from the sea, uh, such as seaweed, shellfish, uh, sea cucumbers, urchins. And this tradition uh, continues today. And so this is a, a, a drawing from an art show called Mirai Kanai uh, about women ama divers. Um, these alma free divers were always women. They would dive to depths of about 80 feet or you know, even as much as 30 meters, um, harvesting seaweed, shellfish, and urchins for food. And these were always women. This was a cooperative venture. They had rules that ensured sustainability of the ocean environment and resources. And um, I was really excited because as, when I was doing research for this presentation, um, I found a really cool film that was produced by the United Nations University that illustrates traditional ecological knowledge from the lens of Japanese ama divers. And I was really thrilled because I spent some time visiting Hegura Island, which you're going to see in this video, so it was really terrific to find this film. So if you can bear with me, it's about a 10-minute film, but I think it's really worth seeing and, and really puts in a nutshell understanding of what sustainability and traditional ecological knowledge is all about. This high-pitched sound is called isobue, which means sea whistle. Ama divers make this sound when they breathe between dives. Through the ages, an occupation called ama has existed along the coast of Japan. Those who work as ama free dive to catch seafood and collect seaweed. At Hegura Island, 50 kilometers offshore from Wajima City in Ishikawa Prefecture, there are still many Ama divers. From the Edo to the Showa period, residents of Ama Town in Wajima City went to Hegura Island from July to September to work there for the diving season. The movement from the main one to Hegura Island during the summer continues today. Some choose not to reside on the island and commute daily. Until around 1935, they celebrated with festive red rice when a girl was born. The birth of a girl means the continuance of the family business of Amma. Fishing for such a long time. 
They have determined and set the fishing season, fishing hours, and prohibited areas. They have also discussed whether to use new tools. They have been aware that things that enable them to catch more fish could lead to the depletion of resources. So they have made rules and continue to try to ensure that the rules are respected in the community. In the Meiji era, diving goggles were in 1964, the AMA began using wetsuits. They first discussed whether to use these new tools and how the new tools might affect their fishing practices. Those who dove wearing only a loincloth when they were young now wear wetsuits and diving masks. When they come back from fishing, they check to see if they have taken any undersized horned turban, which is a type of sea snail. Any that are too small must be thrown back. Everyone rides bicycles to the fish market. There are only two cars on the island, one for garbage collection and the other for emergencies. This is one of the rules set by the community. alarm bell shows that the depletion of ocean resources is coming not only from overfishing. Ama divers dive four hours a day if the weather allows them. Japan Meteorological Agency data confirms what the Ama say, showing that in the last 100 years, the average sea temperature in the Sea of Japan rose 1.68 degrees Celsius. Abalonia live in a rocky area intersected by the sea currents. The warmer temperatures may have affected the growth of the seaweed on which the abalone feed. I 
雪が悪い。私はもっと、私はちょっと、やっぱそんだけ海も汚れてるっていうか。There is no scientific data to explain the drop off in the abalone catch. However, many AMA divers mentioned the changing ocean environment. The islanders decide as a community on the areas where fishing is prohibited and on ocean cleaning day in order to prevent resource depletion. We don't know what's going to happen. It's up to nature, one AMA said. The islanders live close to nature and they have strong faith in nature and the ocean. Hegora Island is only five kilometers long. On such a small island, there are seven Shinto shrines and many altars. This is the first day of the Wajima Grand Festival. Today, the residents of Ama Town celebrate this year's good harvest and pray for the next year. This festival is based on the story that a female deity from Kegora visits to see the male deity in Wajima. Men dress up as women and they go into the ocean with the Mikoshi, a portable shrine. Maybe they pray that the sea whistle never stops and that the Ama practice lasts. The oldest working AMA on the island is 92 years old. For them, diving is not mere work, but something they feel driven to do. They have spent hundreds of thousands of hours in the ocean. It's an important part of their lives. Will this ancient practice continue? Um, thank you for bearing with me with the film. Um, I really felt that it illustrated the basic elements of traditional ecological knowledge and how it really reflects sustainable practices that are inherent in traditional cultures. Um, it's also one of the few real examples of sustainability that exists today. Um, but you know, as the film illustrated, maybe not for long. So uh, it was for me. It was just really. Um, a great lesson in, in understanding sustainable uh, practices. So I'm going to try and define um, traditional ecological knowledge and basically the defining elements are the evolving knowledge acquired by local peoples through direct contact uh, with the environment and, and this uh, happens over many generations. Um, Traditional ecological knowledge is also place-based. It's very specific to a place. It emphasizes connection to place um, and yields an understanding of the complex relationships within ecosystems, um, as well as anchoring community values and cultural identity around sustainability. And you know, I'm here. This is a photo of uh, clam diggers over at Tahola, which is uh, on the Quinault Reservation. Now, traditional ecological knowledge, and I added the word ecological knowledge in there um, versus traditional knowledge, and it's also known as TEK, so you may hear that term TEK, that's what it means. And basically, it's a body of knowledge that is accumulated over a multi-generational time period. 
Um, TEK is handed down through generations by cultural transmission, and usually that's oral tradition, and emphasizes uh, the relationship of living beings with one another and the environment. And this is basically the embodiment of um, the term sustainability. Um, usually, traditional knowledge systems are common property with complex internal rules and social obligations within a community. And it has in common with Western science that it's based on an accumulation of observations over time. And TEK takes into account a reverence for all living and non-living beings and is more than just a traditional view of science. Um, TEK is distinctly a holistic understanding of the world that is incorporated into their way of life. Um, this is a, a photo of the first salmon ceremony with the Swinomish tribe. Um, I put together kind of um, a little table here, kind of comparing uh, traditional ecological knowledge with Western science. And, and although it's not really practical to make comparisons, you know, there are some overlaps in, um, in, in both uh, ways of looking at the world. Um, each of these systems embrace different value systems, and I'm kind of summarizing them um, as you see them. So with uh, traditional ecological knowledge, it's usually an oral tradition, uh, very holistic and integrated, um, and not compartmentalized. Um, it's based on observation experience, as is Western science, and also based on cumulative collective experience, um, and mostly qualitative. Uh, usually they use data from resource users, you know, data being observations, um, who have been in one uh, for a long time in one location. And this is really applied to daily practices and rooted in sustainability and cultural values. Now, uh, if we're going to compare Western science, you know, it's usually a written tradition rather than oral. Uh, Western science tends to be reductive and compartmentalized although it's also based on observation and analysis um, and experience as well. Um, Western science is based on, you know, kind of preconceived laws and theories as well as model building, uh, usually uh, quantitative rather than qualitative, and really relies on data from special experts. Um, Western science is also usually a short time series, usually research that's conducted in Western science is done for a set amount of time, unless you're looking at long-term monitoring, and often over a, a large area, not just a, a small isolated area. Um, and then speaking of isolation, much of that resource uh, research is isolated and not really often applied to real life uh, management or um, ways of doing things, and I think Western science really prides itself in being objective and value-free. Now, sometimes it's uh, really difficult to think about how you can incorporate TEK into education programs, and so these are some things that I've learned uh, over the past few years. Uh, in making this kind of successful crossover um, and incorporating um, TEK into programs. Um, I think it's really essential, uh, these are kind of ground rules, and it's essential to use native instructors and scientists. So we try and work with tribal elders as well as tribal biologists who work with the tribes. We want to connect students with people who walk both worlds. Um, meaning, you know, working with um, tribal people who may be resource managers or uh, administrators, you know, understand the importance of cultural tradition and integrating that um, into student learning. Um, you want to also design programs with appropriate content, uh, use traditional teaching and learning methods such as mentoring or process-based learning to present uh, Western science. Uh, one size doesn't fit all, which is usually what's used in most schools. Um, and I think it's important to understand uh, the pedagogies that are used by uh, Native Americans. Also, I think it's important to also make space for possible student conflict, uh, concern, or confusion between Western science and traditional knowledge. And oftentimes, um, 
TEK and Western science may look to be at odds and not necessarily um, be able to be complementary, although it can be depending on the way it's presented. And so, you know, I think it's really important to respect and honor um, traditional knowledge, uh, especially in the context of when you're teaching Western science. And also allow students um, time and um, favorable reflection on their own identities and values. So when you're incorporating TEK into education programs, uh, I think one of the main elements is that it has to be local. And so even though you can provide a framework for um, incorporating TEK or any kind of traditional culture um, into your curriculum, you know, it has to be localized. And so something that you may do, for example, with the Macaw Tribe, uh, which is in the northwest corner of uh, Washington, may not be applicable to a Puget Sound tribe that you're working with. Cultural traditions are different. Uh, you know, even uh, cultural values may also be a little bit different. And also it's important to identify a, a mentor or some contact with the tribe. Um, and you know, you might not, uh, although I have a lot of respect for anthropologists, um, many tribal people don't. And so it's, it's really important to identify a tribal mentor. Um, you also have to have permission from tribal government to actually use TEK. And so it's very important for you to connect with tribal elders or cultural cooperatives um, of the tribes um, so you are not really encroaching on intellectual property um, issues. Um, the other thing is whenever it's possible, you want to follow tribal protocols. Um, that includes uh, introducing people, um, getting people on board to your program, and you just want to know, make sure that you talk to people in the tribe to find out who the you know, authorities are and, and, and the proper protocols that you need to follow. We try and hire tribal resource people whenever possible. Um, and uh, don't assume that you, know, you don't have to give them any kind of compensation. We try and give them uh, a stipend uh, whenever possible. And um, you, as the uh, program planner, really needs to plan for and implement a mutually beneficial relationships so it's not perceived that you are just uh, taking from them and taking their culture and trying to incorporate in something that you're trying to do. Um, I've been involved with multicultural education, and I really like this model that was put together by James Banks, um, who is a professor at the University of Washington in multicultural education. And so I base this model of multicultural inclusion, you know, kind of focused on uh, the inclusion of TEK and how to integrate this into your curriculum or your program. And um, basically, this is similar to kind of a food web model with the simplest and um, most rudimentary elements at the bottom of this um, triangle, and then move, working upwards into having a more integrated and inclusive program. So this model is going to take a little bit of explanation. So on the very bottom of this triangle, you have contributions and festivals. And so that's kind of um, a token inclusion of you know, cultural elements um, such as food, holidays, um, cultural heroes, customs, and so, you know, I'm talking about things like, uh, oh, you know, having fry bread in the classroom or, you know, uh, celebrating only um, indigenous culture on indigenous people's day, that kind of thing like that. And so, um, you know, although it's a start and you always have to work in baby steps, um, this sort of contributions and, and festivals um, element is, is actually, um, kind of can, can be viewed as sort of token. And so as you're moving up into you know, inclusion of, of multiculturalism, then uh, the next uh, part of the triangle is called added ethnic content, which could uh, include things like adding um, stories about Native Americans or arts and crafts into a curriculum. So it's not really changing your curriculum but what you're really doing is essentially having add-ons. Um, and so although it may add to the richness of the curriculum, um, it's really not as inclusive as you think it is. And, and so then we move up 
into the next tier, and that's program transformation. And um, you know, this is really the important part where you're changing the structure of your program to include concepts and issues from an indigenous perspective or multicultural perspective. This can include um, integrating native language, changing the kinds of pedagogies or teaching methods that you're, that you're using, so maybe having more of an apprenticeship or mentoring system instead of just stand-up lecture um, uh, in presenting your um, curriculum. Inclusion of important issues to the tribe, such as food sovereignty rights or usual and accustomed area of fishing and hunting issues, for example. And so, you know, you actually change the structure and perspective of your, um, of your curriculum to actually include these elements. And then the highest tier is where you want uh, to include social action where students are actually making decisions on important issues to them and then they take action to try and come up with solutions for them. Um, I'll try and give you some examples of programs I've been involved in um, at Seattle Aquarium that illustrate these sort of various levels of inclusion. Um, and you know, to do any of this, it has to be an intentional part of the person putting together the program. It just sort of doesn't happen. Um, I did want to tell you to tread cautiously when you are using TEK. Um, you know, a lot, you have to keep in mind that Native communities own their own intellectual property rights, and this includes art, this includes stories and song, um, as well as uh, some of their traditional knowledge. And so, um, you know, you have to respect that, and, you know, they may not want to share it with you. Um, you want to make sure that the traditional ecological knowledge not be taken out of context or, or misrepresented, and you definitely want to obtain consent of the appropriate governing body. Um, I think that part is really, really important. And so, for example, for one of our programs, we wanted to find out the um, native uh, Coast Salish names of different marine animals and, and organisms, but we needed to get permission from the cultural and language teacher first uh, to make sure that that was something that we could do. Um, also, again, I just wanted to reiterate that we, um, whenever you can, hire and train Native staff to assist in your program and always acknowledge the contributions of um, your Native resource people. So now I'm going to give you some examples of integrating traditional knowledge with Western science in some of the programs um, I've been involved in uh, through my work at Seattle Aquarium. I've been uh, working with local tribes in Washington State for over seven years and, and wanted to share um, some of my experience so you can learn from my mistakes, and I've made plenty, and understand that integration of TEK uh, is an involved process that really forces you to operate out of the box. And you know what I've learned over seven years is it's a really baby steps. Um, it's taken me a long time um, basically just to do the relationship building and trust building that's really necessary um, to be successful in this kind of program. Uh, I want to start with the Salmon Homecoming Celebration, and this is uh, an annual event that we have at Seattle Aquarium, uh, and we're involved with about 12 different tribes um, in the Puget Sound and Outer Coast areas um, where we celebrate the return of the salmon. Um, what you're looking at now are students um, and teachers from the Nia Bay Elementary School, where the students actually did uh, cultural performances and perform traditional song and dance to welcome other school children that were coming to the celebration. Um, we have about 12 um, to 15 um, environmental organizations and tribal groups that had environmental and cultural booths for students to experience hands-on activities. Um, and we really wanted to meld tribal science and culture, so we emphasized things like the Elwha Dam removal, um, Indian fishing um, technology, and salmon restoration efforts that are you know, going on with, with different tribes. Um, and we also used high school leaders from the Muckleshoot Tribal School to lead groups and act as uh, student mentors for activities. Um, I want to move on to the Ocean Science Program, and this is a NOAA-funded uh, program on Olympic Peninsula, and um, we 
uh, came to the end of our funding about two years ago, but, but continuing the program with the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. And it's been um, a really great partnership where we wanted to bring ocean literacy to coastal communities, and there are many tribal communities with a, along the coast. Um, the Olympic Peninsula is home to uh, many Native American tribes, including the Macaw, the Quileute, if you remember Twilight or you Twilight, um, the Quinault Nation, um, the Ho, uh, the Lower Elwha and Jamestown Slalom tribes. And so basically what we uh, wanted to do was um, take students to their local beaches and then introduce uh, simple field investigations and uh, Western science to a lot of the beaches where the students already had local familiarity and went all the time with their parents and their families. Um, but we tried to introduce a different way of looking at the beach. Um, here we have students on one of those beach field trips in the Cooley Tribal School. And in the classroom, um, many at many tribal majority public schools and or tribal schools, teachers uh, are working with cultural and language instructors and elders to teach traditional culture and language. And so um, you know, as our program uh, grows, we really want to work closely with these cultural teachers to come with us on the field trips. And so they can also interpret some of the culture um, as well as, as language and Western science. Uh, we also do classroom outreach um, to integrate science, art, and culture into marine science. Um, here we have students uh, making fish prints on the left and then um, conducting uh, sand studies on the right. And, and this is uh, Ocosta Elementary and Nia Bay Elementary out on the Olympic Peninsula. Now, we have found that teachers are what make our program sustainable over the past six years, and, and I think this is one of the best entry points for inclusion of TEK into marine education programs. Um, and, and we feel that it's really, really important for the teachers to, to understand how they can integrate this into their classroom practice. At our teacher workshops, um, we've had speakers um, who um, have uh, incorporated na native language and stories into our workshop, as well as um, cultural experts who can speak to the use of marine plants and animals and art and traditional food technologies. Um, at our last workshop, we had um, a woman from the Macaw Museum and Cultural Research Center um, who was a cultural expert introduce stories and native vocabulary language that um, are used in the local high school curriculum. And so she was telling us stories about uh, traditional seal hunting and how that's incorporated into their uh, school curriculum. And then we also had um, tribal biologists um, that were actually uh, conducting a simulation of sea lion scat analysis as an indicator of ecosystem health. And so this was really a great melding of learning about traditional sealing, uh, sealing practices or seal hunting practices from the McCall cultural person and then following up with how McCall resource biologists use Western science to learn about ecosystem health. And so our, our ocean science program really wanted to incorporate issues, traditional knowledge content into the curriculum and present teaching and learning from um, various perspectives. And so this is kind of a really good example of sort of that tier three of um, inclusive teaching methods. Now as an offshoot from our ocean science program, we started an ecosystem pen pal program between Nia Bay Elementary, um, and which is uh, with the Macaw tribe, and then Haha Hione Elementary School in Hawaii. And this is a, a school on the island of Oahu. And basically students created field guides about their ocean environment, including uh, native names for different animals uh, and other sea organisms. They exchanged letters about their place and then also um, at the end of this time um, discuss the effects of things like uh, climate change and how it affects their respective communities. And so this cultural um, exchange and personal action mode actually represents kind of Three, stage three inclusion, um, but not really um, 
the, the students actually coming up with their own problems and, and action. And the students also made ecosystem suitcases where they got cultural artifacts as well as natural history artifacts and, and then exchanged them. So I thought that was really a really cool program. Now probably the program that I'm um, most proud of is our Citizen Science High School Nearshore Monitoring Program and how we integrated this with a uh, Coastal America program in Washington, D.C. And um, basically we're working with the Suquamish and Muckleshoot tribes here in Puget Sound. Um, shellfish are really an important cultural and economic resource for the Suquamish community and with the help of tribal biologists, the students raised oysters from hatched larvae and then released spat um, in mesh bags on their school beach. And then in the following year, the citizen science students ended up uh, conducting inventory of surviving oysters and looking at predators in their oyster bags. We were also working with cultural teachers, and so in their language class, they were learning the names for the marine organisms. Um, students also did clam surveys on their local tribal beaches. They were sampling, collecting, and measuring clams to get population estimates uh, for their tribal harvest. And so this really kind of put them on uh, understanding uh, marine resources career track and how doing Western science also helps inform uh, cultural practices of tribal harvesting. Um, students also participated in their nearshore monitoring their local beach, uh, looking at changes in physical beach characteristics and doing presence and absence studies of marine invertebrates and seaweeds. And so, you know, they were getting both uh, the cultural and Western science. And as a culminating project, uh, the students participated in the Coastal America Summit on Oceans and Climate in Washington, D.C. And the students were supposed to come up with some kind of action plan, and they decided they wanted to create an ocean acidification awareness project and implement um, a plan to increase awareness of ocean acidification in their local tribal communities. And so I wanted to share with you a, a really quick three-minute video that uh, the students um, put together on ocean acidification awareness. salmon home on a, on a string just to feed us. Hopefully some of my grandkids and their grandkids will see some salmon. Everything that we eat is pretty much deteriorating. Slowly, but it's deteriorating. It is kind of frightening to me. This is you know, one of our main sources of income. And beyond that, it's tradition, you know, to me and my whole family. If we pollute this enough and the clams go, what are we going to do? When I look at my fellow tribal members, I really realize how important it is to remember all the elders and what Swami stands for. Because our ancestors died for this right. If it wasn't for them, me and all my fellow tribal members wouldn't be here tonight. And... This is one of the days I'm proud to be Indian. 
to say the least. We know what's going on. We know what the what the changes are. You know, us Indian tribes, we're here all the time. We don't go anywhere. We're on the water. We're on the beaches. We're we're harvesting and we're gatherers of our resource. You know, and we want we want everybody we want the shellfish growers to be there to help us in this coalition of keeping the water clean. You know, and keeping our, our our sound healthy, but our sign is right in front of our eyes. It's a really fantastic um, illustration of the combining, uh, I guess, traditional culture with Western science. And since 2008, the Coast Salish Nation and Swinomish Indian Tribal Community has worked in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey and examining coastal waters of the Salish Sea and uh, providing this new strategy to blend Western science and Coast Salish culture to study water quality and its effect on ecosystem dynamics. And so as um, if you don't know what the canoe journeys are, many of the uh, western Washington and uh, I guess southern uh, BC tribes get together in one rendezvous spot and they all go by canoe um, to a particular um, tribal site every year and it's a different site every year. And so many of these tribes are, are traveling all through Puget Sound and along the coast um, in, in their canoes and so the USGS um, had the canoes tow water quality instrumentation to log water quality parameters along the canoe journey routes and so they came up with this really fantastic water quality data. They've been doing this since 2008. Um, and uh, so they have this really great set of data um, uh, along the entire route of the canoe journeys. And it's just sort of a great example of, of integrating TEK with Western science. And so basically in conclusion, um, I wanted to say that culturing marine science education speaks to a need, I think, um, for a paradigm shift in our approach and how we think about um, environmental education and marine education. Um, and we need to reconceptualize the relationship between culture and environment and educating our youth in the best way we can. Um, so I'm hoping that this presentation you know, gave you some opportunity to glimpse the potential for reframing um, how we teach marine education to our kids around the idea of culture and traditional ecological knowledge uh, and understanding its connection to a, a real sustainable future. And so. Thank you so much. And if we have some questions, then I think that I'm open for that now. Yes, thanks very much, Karen, uh, for the presentation. Looks like you guys are up to some really um, fascinating and, and uh, useful and uh, I hope gratifying, you know, work uh, down there with the with the native folks and the traditional knowledge. Um, I failed to say at the beginning um, that if you do have questions, please type them into the question box. You should see that as part of your sort of participant panel. Um, and I will then um, read the questions uh, for Karen so that she can answer them. Um, and we do have uh, one question uh, coming in already, Karen, and this question is, how are your projects funded? Oh, that's a really good question. And so our ocean science um, program was funded through a NOAA ELG grant, and if I understand from the sequester and, and the budget problems in Congress, they're no longer going to be funding those after next year. Um, and so we were funded for five years. Um, continued funding to keep this program going, however, has been funded by the local marine um, resource committees, and so in Grays Harbor and also uh, the North Pacific Coast uh, Marine uh, resource committee and then we've been trying to get other grants as well uh, some of you know the staff funding from the aquarium is actually comes from the aquarium comes from the aquarium I um, think that sort of got cut off on uh, my so audio that was for the ocean science. yeah that was from the ocean science program so for some of the other programs salmon homecoming uh, celebration is actually funded by the salmon homecoming alliance and we just get donations mainly from the tribes, uh, but also from other entities, including our um, the City of Seattle and then also Seattle Public Utilities and other um, 
agencies and organizations. Great. But all the other programs are, are internally funded. Another question here is, you know, you mentioned that it's taken uh, sort of years, really, to develop some of the relationship and, and trust building um, that's important for these programs. Can you describe maybe in a, uh, a little bit more how that process took place? Or were there specific events or, or how you were able to sort of facilitate that relationship building? Well, that's a really good question, and it really takes time. It really helps if you can contact, um, you know, a, a, a person in that community that is known to be kind of a leader and or liaison person with other groups, you know, and also, you know, it really helps to get introductions from other people. Um, you know, my whole introduction to a lot of the um, community, the tribal communities on the Olympic Peninsula were through a contact through the Marine Sanctuary and, and, and Bob Steelquist, um, you know, who has been a longtime education outreach person for the Marine Sanctuary on the Coast National Marine Sanctuary, had already developed these relationships and so it was a little bit easier for me. Um, because he introduced me to all these folks, and so that sort of gave me a little bit of instant credibility. So if you can find that contact person that already has some relationships, that is always good. I know with the Salmon Homecoming Alliance, it took me a good five years of going to meetings um, before several of the board members would even say hello to me. I mean, I really had to prove that um, my interest in working with them was really, you know, a mutually beneficial relationship, not something that um, we were just trying to check off the box that, hey, we're working with tribal people. And so, um, you know, I think it just takes a lot of stick to um, and just being there and then showing that the relationship is real. I don't know if that was a very good answer, but, um, you know, it's tough and it's all baby steps and, and my advice is just really hang in there. Um, you know, you have to realize that many of these tribal communities, you know, have a 500-year history of really, you know, treaty violations of uh, just not trusting the government and not trusting um, people outside their community because they've really been um, abused and, and uh, you know, not valued. So, you know, uh, there's some of that that you have to overcome, but I think that, you know, Tribal communities have always been really accepting of people for who you are and not necessarily um, as part of a bigger group. And so I think that it's those personal relationships are really important. Okay, great. And one other question is um, what of the programs you described, are any of them or, or sort of all um, being embraced by the local communities or which ones are sort of the most popular what you feel like are the most effective that are really being embraced back like you're not necessarily pushing them as hard anymore because I, I, really I, want to. I, I think that um, well I think the ocean science program has been really um, em embraced by the tribal communities but also you know the whole coastal community on the Olympic Peninsula and so we've gotten really really good support from teachers administrators and parents and the ocean science program also tries to um, provide some family uh, chaperone training as well and so um, you know and get the parents involved so it has gotten a lot of you know community support the other program um, is the citizen science program and um, I, you know that that one has been really really strongly supported because there aren't a lot of um, programs like that for high school youth and especially that focus on tribal youth and, and integrating the use of tribal biologists uh, and people in the community to be part of the program. So, um, I, you know, I, I think that that's a real key to the success is, is really trying to involve the tribes as much as possible. Well, great. On behalf of our Pacific Ocean Education team, I really want to thank you for uh, taking the time to present this stuff to us. It was very uh, fascinating. Uh, folks out there, let other of your colleagues know that these are recorded and this webinar will be available probably within a few days uh, on the Ocean Alaska Science and Learning Center website. And keep your eye on your email. We'll send you out um, invitations uh, to our next webinar, which is yet to be determined in subject, but we got a few irons in the fire and we'll certainly let folks know as soon as we have uh, 
confirmed webinar. So thanks very much, uh, Karen, and okay. thanks to all you folks for attending as well. Thank you very much. And, and I did send Jim um, a list of resources, and so um, you know, just uh, email Jim and, and he can send that out to you. And it has some uh, really good papers and, and other books and references uh, on TEK and um, education. Yes, so, thanks thank for mentioning so that. I, 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 I forgot to mention that. So yeah, there are some resources available. If folks want them, shoot me an email. And uh, I actually have the whole PowerPoint, too, if anyone's uh, interested. So uh, all right, thanks again. Everybody have a good day. Okay. All right, thank you.